Day two of DevOps Morocco with Andres Almiri. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too, Catherine. So, Andres, the Java champion, is giving uh, all the talks this conference. So, you've got two talks uh, one on Java libraries and one on Gradle plugins, and then you've got a Birds of Feather on documentation. That is tonight, yes, that's, that's correct. Cool. Um, so, let's get started about uh, Gradle plugins. Can you tell me a bit about your talk on Gradle plugins? Yeah, so as many people know, Gradle is a build tool just like, like in Maven, and it's extensible via plugins. Uh, one of the things that people find out with Gradle is that it's so easy to write Groovy code in the build because it just supports a general programming language. Uh, the bad thing of this approach is that you can quickly find that many people just write whatever they think is going to solve the problem. And the build file keeps growing and growing and growing. It's kind of hard to figure out what the build is actually doing. So if there were a plugin that serves a particular purpose and solves the problem and gives you the feature, it would be much better if people were able to use that plugin. Yeah. So what I do with this talk is to showcase a list of plugins that I have found that are very useful in many use cases uh, that I have encountered with my customers. So you mentioned to me earlier about licensing. Yes, uh, there is one specific plugin called License Plugin. Um, this one gives you two benefits. The first one is that it can keep track of the file headers in, in all your source code so that your files are conformant to a license. Because in many licenses, at least the open source ones, they, you must comply in such a way that the license is displayed correctly on the files themselves. And the second one is uh, there are some customers where um, if they are working with open source libraries, they have to be really aware of what kind of licenses they are using. Uh, it may be Apache, it may be EPL, BSD, MIT, there are so many different out there. But we have to be aware of the viral ones. Some customers are happy, some others are don't when you use these viral licenses like GPL and their variants. Uh, so if you have a project that has many dependencies and you need to generate a report of all the different licenses being used by your project, it can take you some time to do manual words, searching, googling, whatnot, for all these different things. So the license plugin is able to generate a report automatically based on all your runtime and test dependencies. Uh, so it's just a couple of minutes instead of spending hours searching the internet for all these licenses. Makes life a lot easier. Definitely, much, much easier. And it's part of this kind of preventative, so rather than people getting carried away with a really long build tool with bits of groovy in, it's kind of teaching people how to use build files just for managing dependencies rather than for... Right. Um, besides that, I think that one of the philosophies that I like to follow when uh, creating a build file for Grail is that what you see in the build file is how your project deviates from the conventions and from the plugins conventions. So if you see a Grail build file that has lots of lines of code, there are maybe two issues. One is that developers, the people that were working in build, may not be aware of a plugin that will make their life easier. Or secondly, they are deviating so much from the established conventions that it would be better to abstract what they're doing in their own plugin of their own. Um, so you mentioned um, binary incompatibility. So I'm not familiar with that. Is that if, when you have too many plugins, you're using binary plugins? And mm, it's, it's related to that, but it's mostly uh, the fact that, say that you have two releases of a particular library. Yeah. And uh, if you follow semantic versioning, that means that if the major version has moved on into, uh, has increased, then you know you've, you are guaranteed to have a binary compatibility. But if you do not follow semantic versioning, and uh, how can you tell that if you upgrade to the next version, it's going to get you in trouble? Yeah. So you need a tool that, regardless of the semantic versioning that you follow or you don't follow, can tell you if you add a new class or you add methods to an interface that is a problem in JDK 7 and prior, but not a problem in JDK 8 because of extension methods and a few other things that were added to Java 8. But because not everybody follows the same things, we need to find how if there were new fields or new methods, new interfaces, and see if it's safe to upgrade to the next version. And there are a handful of plugins that give you this information. Cool. Um, so you're the talk on Java libraries. So what have we got to look forward to with new or recent Java libraries? 
Uh, well, the the um, the goal of this project, uh, uh, this the talk, is to showcase some of the very well known or a little bit lesser known open source libraries that will make working in your daily life much, much easier. Uh, uh, this talk showcases libraries that are custom tailored for production code, but also for testing code, because it's not enough to just write code and hope that it works in production, right? So we need to test them. And um, I think uh, the, the recession so far when I have um, showcased these libraries before is very positive. So people react and are very good to this, this, this list of libraries. Um, so, there's been a lot of talk over the last two years <laughs> about Java 9 and the module system and how that will change everything. So do you think that will change the way that people write libraries and people use libraries? Because they're now going to have to use libraries in specific set of their code base rather than all of the code base. Yes, there's definitely going to be a change and we have seen a little bit of that already with Java 8 given that we got new constructs such as method references and lambda expressions and a new set of APIs like optional and streams. Uh, some libraries have decided to uh, say that our base compatibility is JDK 8 going forward and if somebody wants to use the library prior to that, there might not be an option for you. In JDK 9, the problem will be uh, much bigger because besides the new APIs, you also have a new way to make the linking within the uh, the, uh, the classes because now you have the module system. Yeah. So a library author now has the choice to say we are going to follow the module system. So everybody that consumes must be inside JDK 9 and follow the proper rules of, of modules. And some other libraries and projects will say this is great, but we cannot migrate our whole user base to JDK 9 for so several reasons. So they will have to create a compatibility package. So have at least two different branches. One covers the, the world before JDK 9, and another that covers the world after Java 9. And for some, this will be easy, and for others, that could be a problem. Um, so, if only you're helping with the Running with yes, that's correct. <laughs> uh, so you're a huge advocate of open source. Think, is it over, over ten years ago when you started JSON? Then uh, my first open source project was a JSON project called JSON. Exactly, very close to ten years ago. I got a little bit more than that. <laughs> oh, we can leave off the months. <laughs> um, so, uh, open source is a huge passion of yours. Yes, it is. And what's your advice to someone looking back with your kind of ten years of experience with open source to someone who maybe hasn't really got into it yet and they're thinking about it? Uh, my recommendation is definitely find a way to get into open source. It's, there are many ways, uh, and the easiest one is to um, once you encounter a problem, you're you're most likely going to use an open source project in one way or another, and perhaps you encounter a problem or a missing feature. So my recommendation is that find the project page, wherever it is, and send a message, open a ticket, or just communicate that need to the other side and start a conversation. It may, for some people, this will be enough. For other people, besides the report, they can supply a test case that can let the other, the other side know this is prop, how this properly thing should work. Or even better, you can even contribute back adding a, a patch to solve the problem or to fix, you know, to fix the bug. So there are many ways. And once you start this, uh, it's a little bit of an, an addiction because you actually feel good because you're contributing back to uh, a project that you're using yeah. and actually can help somebody else. And then you do it again, and then you do it again, and suddenly you are realize that you have created your own project now you get contributions from somebody else, and then suddenly you have the opportunity to come here to beautiful Morocco and have a talk. Right? Ten years later. Ten years later, exactly. I, I, to be honest, I have no idea that this will happen to me ten years ago. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Well, thanks. <laughs>